Well, hello, hello. Today we are talking about the Grell OAE-1, which is a collaboration between Axel Grell and Mastrop. Axel Grell is, of course, the legendary headphone designer behind some of the most iconic headphones ever made, like the Sennheiser HD 600, 650, and HD 800. And this one is unique. Very unique. And I'm going to try and make today's video a little bit different from the usual reviews that I do, because there is something philosophically interesting about this product. I kind of see it as a way to test the limits of conventional concepts surrounding headphone design, and that's what I want to get into. So, let's get started. Okay, so as we get going here, some quick disclaimers. This unit was actually sent to me by Mark Ryan over at Super Review, or as we like to call him, Mr. Super. So big shout outs to Super Review. Go check out his review on these. Be sure to subscribe to his channel and say hi from me. And as always, I do not get to keep any of these products. I haven't been paid to say anything in particular about them, and all thoughts and opinions here are my own. And of course, all of this is made possible by Headphones.com. If you like what we do here and find it useful, consider supporting us by checking out Headphones.com. And this is also where we've published a very comprehensive article by listener on this headphone. And he goes into a lot of the science behind the concept of soundstage and whether or not it is something that we should care about. But I actually think the story about the Grell OAE-1 isn't really about soundstage. In my view, it's more about timbre and challenging convention. And so this is going to focus mostly on the sound signature of this headphone, not so much the ergonomics, which are... It's a clampy boy. Let's just say that. I mean, it looks nice, but it's a clampy boy. But anyways, here's my philosophical take on all of this. So on the one hand, you've got Axel Grell's more traditional design in the HD 600 right here, and the various iterations of this concept, which are all extremely well known for their timbre. So the naturalness of the presentation and all of that good stuff. And you can also think of this as having effectively a tilted diffuse field like voicing, or as Grinnacle may put it, plain water. I'm somewhat of a plain water enjoyer myself. Of course, it is deficient in the bass, that's its key weakness, but for the rest of its sound signature, it is very, very good. Now, for those unaware, a diffuse field is a sound field where the sound comes from all directions, which means, effectively, it comes from no specific direction. And this makes sense for headphones, given the use condition of headphones being worn on the head rather than having the sound source be from a specific location and direction, like what you get with speakers. And the HD600's design is congruent with what's been said on this topic for decades now. So if anybody's heard us talk, for example, on the live stream that we do about Gunter Thiel, as well as, of course, the work from Hammershoy and Mahler in their design criteria for headphones paper, I'll leave both of those papers linked in the description if you guys are interested in. But that's also probably a bit too into the weeds for what we need here. All you need to know is that the HD600 is a solid open back headphone that fits well with, as said, the conventional wisdom of headphone design. That's really what this one is doing. And then, on the flip side, you've got the Grell OAE-1, which is very much not that. But it is interesting. So, while the design here is extremely open, it places the driver in front, very far in front of the ear, as you can see here. And that's very different from the way it's done on most headphones, including the HD 600. And this has a number of consequences for the sound. So, let's take a look at that in the measurements. So what you have here in the Grell OAE-1 is a headphone that has a number of what seems like very strange features in its tuning, shown here in its frequency response. And the shaded area you see here is also based on that conventional wisdom for what constitutes good sound in headphones, so it's using a diffuse field baseline. And relative to that, yeah, it's objectively not so great. But you might be thinking, why show it relative to that when the point with this headphone is to challenge that convention? Just bear with me on this. So, relative to this, you can see that the Grell OAE-1 has a really strong bass and lower mid-range tilt that tends to dominate over the rest of the sound. And that's one thing. But I want to draw your attention to what's going on in the treble. You can see how there's a strong rise up to what we call the ear gain, where the ear amplifies frequencies the most strongly along the path to the eardrum. And then you get this really strange, subdued treble presentation after that, where it just sort of like cuts everything out. Um, and this might seem like it's just something done at random, or something just didn't work, or like it's an error of some kind. But that's not it at all. That's not what's going on with this headphone whatsoever. So make no mistake, this was not poorly executed. It's conceptually flawed, in my opinion, but not poorly executed. 
And to show that this isn't an issue in execution, I want to move over to a different graph here that doesn't use the diffuse field baseline, and you'll see what I mean. Here is the Grell phone relative to a front biased free field HRTF. So this is not a target curve, this is the response of an ear in a free field, 60 degrees off axis. At the moment, I'm unclear if the Grell phone is specifically aiming for a 60 degree off axis response, or maybe some other angle just with a tilt, given how the low frequency voicing is. But at the very least, the frequency response of the OAE1 above one kilohertz resembles the response at the eardrum that a listener would get with flat measuring speakers positioned at a particular angle in front of the listener. Now, this may all sound super confusing and overly nerdy, so let me try and back up and explain this a little bit. So when you're listening to a speaker in front of you, you get the sound at your eardrum and it might look something like this. But when you turn your head relative to that same speaker, the interaction between the sound and your physical features along the path to your eardrum changes due to you turning your head. And as a consequence, the frequency response, again, of that same speaker at your eardrum also changes. So once you've turned your head, the frequency response at your eardrum might look something like this. But here's the thing, when we're listening to speakers, while we might notice the sound change when we turn our heads, it doesn't sound that all that weird to us. It doesn't sound super not normal. It just sounds like we're hearing it coming from a different direction. It sounds like we're hearing it from that way instead of forward. And the same is true when just hearing things in the world around us. When we hear voices, when we turn our heads, we mainly just notice a directional change in where the voices are coming from. There's obviously an additional change, but the key thing that we notice is that suddenly the voice is behind us or in a from a different direction, not in front of us. That's right, I'm telling you that the voices are not just inside your head. <laughs> but in short, our brains are interpreting the frequency response change at our eardrums as a change in localization for where the sound is coming from, not necessarily a change in timbre. But with headphones, with, with passive headphones and stereo recordings, I should say, because they're worn on the head, when we turn our heads, the sound goes with us as we turn our heads. And so we don't get that positional cue, we don't get that directional shift um, as we sort of turn our heads relative to the sound because it comes with us. And if you would have that same angle shifted frequency response in passive headphones, it would sound really weird because you would have no psychoacoustic priming to tell your brain, hey, the sound is coming from over there. Right? There's no visual cues, there's no gradual shift in the response, nothing that you would normally get when turning your head relative to a sound source because the sound source is going with you as well. And as a consequence, you would notice the timbral weirdness more substantially because that auditory experience is all your brain is getting fed. And because there are no directional or localization cues for what the brain is receiving, the brain goes, whoa, that sounds weird and unnatural. And that is why we use diffuse field as the baseline and not free field or any specific direction based sound field for headphones. We use diffuse field because it is sound that is coming from all directions or effectively no direction because that matches what happens when you're actually wearing these things. The sound is coming from no particular direction. And it's also why the HD 600 sounds natural to most people. Now back to the Grell phone. It's not emulating exactly a speaker-like response with your head turned from to the side or anything like that, like I was just talking about, but it is breaking the concept of diffuse field. That's really what we should be thinking about with this headphone. It's challenging this as the generally agreed upon sound field for headphones. And I should note that diffuse field is still the international standard for headphones and for a good reason. But here's what I find so interesting about all of this. He's clearly gone for something like this intentionally. He's well aware of everything that I just said. I mean, he designed the HD 600 after all. But here's the thing. He also designed the HD 800. Now, I'm not going to say that that headphone tried to break the concept of diffuse field the way that the OAE1 does. In fact, they sound very, very different from one another. More so that the HD 800 was just a tweaking of the original concept of diffuse field. And I know that in their marketing material, they called it diffuse field loudness equalized. Um, but, you know, it was a step away from the original idea, where the HD 600 is actually a better representation of the original diffuse field concept. So in a way, the HD 800 also challenged some of those same conventions around headphone design and the concept of diffuse field, and it created this massive spaciousness effect as a result of its unique voicing and psychoacoustic effects, and while it might also be a bit unnatural, people liked it. Now, I've of course been a vocal critic, 
of the HD 800 sonic characteristics. I find it, you know, to also sound a bit shrill with a notable treble peak around six kilohertz that I'm particularly bothered by. But people are very much impressed by the spaciousness effect that it conveys, and it seems to be done so tastefully. So I will admit that. But I think to wrap up this sort of philosophical take here and what I'm trying to get at, and what I find interesting about this is that in this industry, there are examples of headphones being tuned by ear. There are examples of headphones being tuned at random and just seeing what sticks. And that's not what's going on with the growl phone here. Like that's not at all what this is. And it's also not just something that didn't pan out as intended or you know that they gave up halfway through as I've seen suggested online. Like that's not what's going on with this headphone. From what I can tell, this headphone is as mentioned, Axel Grell's attempt at shaking up the conventions around headphone design. So like, he's already made some of the best headphones that fit with that established science, but he's also made some headphones that have, you know, pushed those boundaries that people have genuinely enjoyed, like the HD800, my opinions on it notwithstanding. And now with the OAE1, he's pushing the boundaries even further. And while I personally see this as a case study in why the conventional wisdom around headphone design and, you know, the benefits of diffuse field is all still correct, like me listening to this side by side with the HD 600, it's very obvious to me which one is better. It's not even close. To my very core, I admire the man's courage in attempting this concept. It's the kind of thing that like, if you just think about like audio design enough, I could see eventually landing at this and wanting to try it. And so as much as in my view, it, it didn't work out and it's just the wrong concept to chase, I, I think it's really cool that he tried. So, how does it sound? And this is where I'm going to rely purely on my subjective take here. In a word, strange. I don't imagine this is the kind of sound that nobody is going to like. In fact, I know there are some who love it. I actually spoke to somebody at an audio uh, convention who heard it and thought it was the best thing that they'd heard. But to me, it sounds basically how it measures. So very warm and overly thick in the bass and the lower mids, while at the same time shouty due to the emphasized ear gain region, which is you know pretty common for headphones that have this kind of emphasis. Um, but it's actually made more intense with the relaxed yeah, mid treble there uh, because it just sort of dominates over the rest. And with all this talk about soundstage, or as I like to call it, the spaciousness effect, because really, I mean, this, this is an illusory effect created by the stereo image that can get enhanced by a particular voicing, I actually don't find this one to sound spacious at all. Like, I think if I ignore everything about, you know, the measurements and just sort of put it on and listen and think about the music and engage with the music mentally, I would say that it has an incredible sense of depth, forward and layering for the frontal image, uh, but still sort of intimate and almost claustrophobic. And if I contrast this with the HD800, which is, again, renowned for its soundstage, the HD800 has a significantly wider and more spacious sounding effect. Obviously, that's in a totally different price range, and I know people are going to come after me for even, you know, mentioning it. Stupid Resolve compares the Growl phone to, you know, $1,500 headphone or something like that. But I just want to mention it because if you look at the tuning for that headphone and compare it to the OAE1, it's almost the opposite in the treble. And I feel like that sense of space enhancement that some people chase, natural space enhancement, it's really those features that you should be on the lookout for. So like a bit of excess energy in that sort of mid treble region. So again, to my ear, the Grell phone sounds like an intimate but very deep presentation, like deep this way presentation that loses out significantly in terms of timbre and that sort of sense of natural pleasantness that you get from a well-balanced treble response. Now, I think folks might be asking, you know, what about, you know, the, the sense of finer little details in the music? In that respect, I noticed two things. One is that there is a kind of smoothing character to certain tones, again, likely due to that subdued treble uh, response. But the other is that for tones like cymbal hits or just like percussive hits in general, things definitely sound compressed to me. And that's, again, it's a common thing that I, I notice when there are resonant harmonics being dominated by lower regions, like what you see with that, you know, emphasized three to five kilohertz. So that kind of balance where there's a strong emphasis to the lower, you know, regions there uh, for the ear gain that can cause this kind of compressed sound for percussive hits. But really those are my main issues with the sound subjectively. But I do also want to acknowledge a couple of things here. One is that for anyone heavily favoring a warmer, thicker presentation with really with a really forward presence to fundamental tones in that mid-range, 
it might be worth a listen uh, because that does almost even overshadow some of the issues in the trouble above that. So some people, they won't even notice those issues, um, but they might also just be more persuaded by that sort of lower register emphasis. The other thing that I wanted to note is that these are highly positionally dependent. They're actually quite consistent uh, in terms of their behavior from head to head when placed identically. But the reality is, is that depending on the shape of the person's head, um, you know, it might fit a bit differently uh, depending on the person, you know, relative to the ear. So when you move them, you know, further back on your head, placing the driver closer to your ear, like it like might be a little bit more conventional, it actually starts to sound a lot more normal. Um, and so, you know, this is going to fall likely within a range for people. So I think it's just worth keeping that in mind. Now, there is, of course, a lot more to talk about with this headphone, like to do with the acoustic impedance, and it's worth understanding if you want to get a more complete picture of what's going on with it. And for that, I would highly encourage you to read Listener's article. There's just a lot more there in it. But for me, I mainly just wanted to give this maybe more philosophical take on it. Like, I know people come at the videos I do hoping to get a clear indication of like, you know, this thing is amazing or this thing is bad. And so in that respect, no, I, I don't recommend it. And I think the general public consensus on this product is that it's not what people want their headphones to sound like. I think that's the general sentiment that you're going to see online. And it's also what I'm going to tell you here as well. But I just wanted to ensure that we don't lose sight of what's genuinely interesting about this product. So it was a gamble and one that didn't work out. But in my view, it's commendable that Grell went for something different. Not just try to do the same thing that he's already done. Like, if you think about it, he's already done the timbre thing with the HD600. He's already done the soundstage thing with the HD800. And so I really can't fault someone for not wanting to do the same thing over again. I think the fair criticism here might be that it feels a, a bit like testing that concept out on the market. But that's also why you have reviewers to tell you what we think. And ultimately, it's the community that decides if this was a good concept to shoot for or not. Personally, I'd love it if the next Grell phone could be something that's maybe a bit more HD 600-like, say with a base shelf. Axel, if you're watching this, let's make it happen. But that is, of course, wishful thinking on my part. Anyways, that is all for me today. As usual, check out the measurements that are linked in the description if you'd like to learn more. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye for now.